Good evening and welcome to our second session in year two, track one of uh, our spiritual growth series. We're actually here, we've actually begun talking about teleos adults. Just to refresh your memory for just a, just a moment here, uh, newborns, brephos, we talked about deliverance, preservation, safety, healing, prosperity, these kinds of things. Then toddlers, the Greek word napios, conquering envy, overcoming strife. These are all things that we've already talked about. Repentance, faith, baptisms in the Holy Spirit, baptism into the body, uh, the uh, baptisms in water. Then adoles adolescence, paid on, overcoming the devil, knowing the Father. And the Bible's very clear about how these uh, make a progression. The Bible's very clear about what newborns are in the Bible and what it takes to go from being a newborn to a toddler, what it takes uh, to uh, uh, go from being a toddler to an adolescent, and then what it takes to become a mature adult believer. This progression is really, really important because oftentimes we try to, we, we do, um, uh, you know, it's fine. It's fine for a newborn believer to begin to catch a glimpse and to begin to work toward loving their enemy. You know, you just don't say, you don't hate your enemies to, until you get here. And it's okay to start loving your enemies, but uh, blessing people that curse you, pray for those that persecute you. Um, you know, it's, it's fine in all these stages to, to work on these things, but, uh, but I maintain that because of what the Bible teaches about spiritual growth, you won't come into the fullness of these things until you won't come into the fullness of loving your enemy until you first come into the fullness of overcoming the devil. You're not going to come, and, and even newborns can overcome the devil, but you're not going to come into a fullness of really having your foot on the devil's neck until you first get over here and deal with some of the situations in your own flesh, like overcoming envy, overcoming strife, and division. You all see this? So these things are, and by the way, in talking about overcoming strife and division, be sure, absolutely sure, that you read my blog post from this morning. Uh, there, is a, there is a post from uh, Whitney Capps um, about the church and division in the church, and it's absolutely brilliant. It's one of the best things I've read in 20 years. So be sure that you read that. So today we're going to be talking about the hidden wisdom of God. We're we'll talking about the wisdom of God. And I want you to turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 in verse 6 start, talks about the hidden wisdom of God and talks about it in the context of being a mature believer or a teleos. In verse 6 it says, However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. Now, I just want you to just want to point out that word in verse six. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature. You see that word mature? You can circle that, underline that if you want to. That word mature is the Greek word teleos. Talios. It means a mature believer. Well, it actually means a mature person, a grown up, an adult. So here, Paul is saying, we talk wisdom, we speak wisdom, the hidden wisdom of God among people who are adults. So what Paul is saying is there are certain things about the plan and purpose of God that can't be comprehended by adolescents, toddlers, or newborns. You have to progress through these things. This is, this, this is not maturity yet. This is just, uh, this is just uh, uh, infant stuff, baby stuff. You got to go from here to here. There's so many people that they want to stay camped in the healing and prosperity messages. I've had people tell me, I've had people tell me to my face that uh, church is not deep enough for them because there's not enough teaching about healing and prosperity. And what they do not understand, we need this. We got to have this. This is, this is where we start. But when you start, when you start messing in their business and talking about conquering envy, 
Hello, somebody. You start talking about conquering envy, overcoming strife, dealing with division, repentance. In other words, when you start talking about their heart, you got to deal with your heart matters. They say, oh, well, I'm going somewhere else because I got to go where it's deep, where they talk about healing and prosperity. No, honey, you got to grow. You need to grow from here to, and you got to deal with this stuff and you got to do that so you can, uh, so you can get your foot on the devil's neck, um, so you can understand how the anointing works. Some people think because they understand how healing and prosperity works that they understand the anointing. And they don't. That's a maturity level as all uh, as well. The anointing, understanding visions, and then moving from there to understanding the hidden wisdom of God. This hidden wisdom happens because we've advanced through these levels. And now as an adult, you're ready to understand how this works. So looking back at verse seven, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, eye has not seen nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God, I love the but gods of the Bible. Things are like this, but God did this, but God did that. Well, here, but God has revealed them. I want everybody to say, has revealed them. Has Has is past tense. We're not waiting for God to reveal anything to us. Because once we get here, here, we're waiting for God to reveal things to us. We're waiting for God to reveal more to us. We're waiting for God to reveal even more to us. But once we get here and we become adults, Paul says in verse uh, six, um, where is it? Yeah, Paul says in verse six and verse seven, he says, we talk about the hidden wisdom of God with people who are adults because now they can understand verse, um, verse 10, that where God, where we realize uh, we're not, we're not praying anymore. We're not saying, God, show me, God, show me this. God, show me, God, I don't understand. God, would you, would you show me what I'm supposed to do? Would you show me these things? We're not saying that anymore because once we become mature believers, we realize God has revealed his plan to us by his spirit. He already has. One of the signs of a mature believer is that they're able to live on the Uh, on the solid foundation of the word that is already true and they can move on with their life instead of waiting for God to do something. It's like, it's like the word and the manifestation of the word is going to intersect with you at the point where it's supposed to happen. Do you, do you see that? It's, it's like if, uh, if, if I'm taking a trip and, uh, and I'm in, uh, you know, let's say I'm, I'm, in, uh, um, I'm in Virginia Beach. At a, at a, I'm going to be in a conference in Virginia Beach in, in a few weeks. So I'm at a conference in Virginia Beach and Deanne is here. And I say, Deanne, I need for you to, I've got to go to Roanoke as soon as this conference is over because I got a meeting in Roanoke and you've got some stuff I need. So I need for you to meet me in Roanoke. So I leave Virginia Beach and I drive to Roanoke, but Deanne has also departed. She has left there and she's going to intersect with me in Roanoke. And so I'm not sweating it. I'm, I'm not driving down the road going, wow, I hope Deanne, I hope she's going to make it. I hope she did, you know, Deanne, did you leave? Are you, are you gone? What do you mean? You did leave? Are, are you sure? I don't hear the car running. I can't hear, move the phone so I can hear the car. I can't hear the car. Are you sure you've left Raleigh? Are you, I don't, I don't, and then I hang up the phone. I look at Connie and say, I don't know if she's left or not. I can't hear the car running. She said she left. She said, she says she's headed up 95, but I don't hear anything and I'm sweating and everything. I don't do that. I'm driving down the road because Deanne said, I'll meet you in Roanoke. I'll intercept. When we get there, then we'll be able to do what we're supposed to do there because she's already left Raleigh. And that's what it means when it's talking about the, the word of already knowing that the word of God it has already been dispersed. Angels have already been dispersed 
The plan and the power of God has already been dispersed. The anointing of God has already been dispersed. And at the time you're supposed to intersect with it, it's going to happen. And in the meantime, you're not sweating it going, you know, I wonder if, I wonder if this is going to happen. I wonder if, I wonder if, I wonder what the word of God says. When you get to this maturity level, you stop wringing your hands because you know that God has already revealed his will to you by his spirit. He has already done. I'm going to show you something really, really, really powerful about knowing the will and plan of God in this whole idea of the hidden wisdom of God. So uh, continuing on here, but God has revealed them. God has revealed his plan, his wisdom to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Um, oh, well, hang, hang with me just a second. I just, oh, that's not even the right program. Hold on, I'm not even in the right program. Ah. Second Peter chapter one, verse 21 says this. First of all, looking at verse 10, it says, God has revealed his will to us. How? Through what? Through who? Through how? Can't hear you. This is not a trick question. Through his spirit, he has revealed his will, his hidden plan to us through his spirit. Now, watch um, 2 Peter 1 21, it says that the Holy Spirit revealed the wisdom of God in the word of God. He revealed the wisdom of God to the holy prophets of old uh, who wrote down the will and the mind of God. And now you have it in your lap. You have the Bible. You have the hidden wisdom of God here. Uh, here in uh, 2 Corinthians 2.10, it says God has revealed the will of God to us by his spirit. So we know this is a spirit thing, but we don't have to walk around going, okay, the uh, Holy Spirit, the Bible says that, you, that the hidden wisdom of God is revealed to us through you. So show me, show me, show me, show me. He already showed us. You're holding it in your lap. This is it. This is the hidden wisdom of God. Now, when this was written, the New Testament church had the first five books of the Old Testament, which is the, uh, the Torah. That's the, that was the, the Bible that they had. And then the letters of Paul, and the, and the Bible actually says there in 2 Peter that, um, that Paul and Peter knew that they were writing scripture when they were writing these letters. It wasn't just like a dear grandma Thank you for the Christmas gift. It wasn't that kind of letter. These were, they knew that they were writing scripture when they wrote. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit revealed the will and plan of God to the men who wrote the word of God. So now we have the hidden wisdom of God right here. The, the, the passage, the, the term hidden wisdom of God is in the Bible five times. The hidden wisdom of God. The great thing is, this is a very bold statement for Paul to make here to these guys to say, well, it's not hidden anymore. God has revealed it to us by his spirit. So how much better off are we because that hidden wisdom of God is actually written down on the page and we can read it. They didn't, when Paul wrote that, he said, God has revealed his hidden wisdom, his plan to us by his spirit. You know, maybe the Corinthians, when they wrote, read this letter from Paul, they thought, well, where is it? Where is it? You know, Holy Spirit, say something. Paul says that, that the hidden wisdom of God is revealed from you and, and we don't have it. We're trying to find it. Well, praise God, we've got it. We've had it ever since the canon was written, ever since the word was written. And so now there is no excuse. There is no excuse for a mature believer to even have the slightest inkling that we don't know what the plan and purpose of God is. But I'm, I, I got something I'm, I'm trying to get to here that's going to really, because some of you are sitting there and you're going, well, but I don't know. I mean, that, sound, that sounds great, Pastor Steve. That's great preaching material. And I see it here on the page, but there are things I don't know that I need to know. I've got a job opportunity. I don't know if I should take it or not. Uh, we've got, I've got an opportunity for, for this. I got an opportunity to go to back to school. And, I, and I, maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't. And I'm not real sure what to do. And you're standing up there telling me that we already have. Paul says the Holy Spirit has already revealed to us the wisdom of God. It looks great. I see it in the Bible, but I'm still dealing with stuff. 
and I don't think I have what you're talking about. I think you do, and I'm going to show it to you. Uh, verse 11 says, but what man knows the things of man except the spirit of a man which is in him. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Only the spirit of God understands the things of God. God is it. You ever have somebody who, you ever know somebody who thinks they know you, but they don't? Isn't that irritating? I, it's so irritating for somebody to look at me and say, oh yeah, I know, I know what you're thinking. Well, actually you don't. Because you don't know me as well as you think. Well, because who knows you? Your spirit, your own spirit knows you. God is saying the same thing. God is saying, just like that's true about you. He's saying, who knows the mind of God except the spirit of God? Now, I want to read this passage to you out of the Amplified Bible. This is such, such a powerful concept. Only the spirit of God understands the things of God. In verse 11 um, this says, no one knows, no one discerns, comes to know and comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. No one discerns, comes to know and comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. And there are some people that without the spirit of God, they think they know the mind of God. They think they know who God is or in some cases who God isn't. Um, I mean, you know, for, for example, uh, I don't know if you've, uh, how many of you have heard of Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking is a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant mind. I mean, just to read his stuff, he wrote, uh, he's written uh, like about, I think eight books, seven or eight books, A Brief History of Time, The Grand Design. And Stephen Hawking uh, says that he's an atheist, that there is no God that, that created the universe. Of course, uh, does anybody remember the name of the movie that Ben Stein made about, um, about God that was in the movie theaters about five years ago? Because it was great. Because at the very end, he sits down and has coffee with Stephen Hawking. And at the very end, he's asking Stephen Hawking, Stephen Hawking, so where did this come from? Well, this came from matter. So where did that come from? Well, it came from this. So where did that come from? And Ben Stein just, just they keep going on and on and on until finally uh, he, uh, he asked Stephen Hawking this final question. And uh, uh, Stephen Hawking said, well, that would have had to uh, have have some kind of origin, some kind of, that would have had to been created by something or someone. I mean, it's easy to say, I don't believe in God. Okay, well, where did this come from? Well, that came from this. Okay, where did this come from? Well, that came from that. And so Ben Stein just keeps going back and back. Okay, so where'd that come from? And after about eight or nine levels and gets back there, Stephen Hawking says, well, it would have had, had to have some kind of origin. Well, that's, that proves that Stephen Hawking is not an atheist. It's easy to say that until you get backed into a corner like that. Um, only, but but the, Stephen Hawking is a brilliant mind. He's not stupid. He's a brilliant mind. But the Bible says that the things of God are discerned by the spirit of God. And that's the one thing Stephen Hawking doesn't have. And that's the one thing that it takes to understand the wisdom of God, to understand all this stuff. It takes a, a mature adult who has the spirit of God to be able to understand the things of God. There are people that are trying, there are people that are really trying to understand God. They're not bad people. It's just that they don't have the Holy Spirit. And the Bible tells us very clearly, it takes the Holy Spirit to understand the things of God. Now in verse 12, it says that when we receive the Spirit of God, then we can know the things that are given to us by God. I want to read to you verse 12 in the Amplified Bible. It says, now we have not yet received the Spirit that belongs to the world, but the Holy Spirit who is from God, given to us that we might realize and comprehend and appreciate the gifts of divine favor and blessing so freely and lavishly bestowed upon us by God. When we get to this level of spiritual maturity as a spiritual adult, that's when we actually, the Bible says that we actually begin to comprehend, realize, and appreciate the favor and blessing of God. It's no longer a, I'm sure God's got it. I have no idea what's going to happen, but I'm sure God's got it. We get to this stage and we get to a maturity stage. Y'all okay? Okay. We get to a maturity stage to where we realize 
and we comprehend and we appreciate the gifts of divine favor and blessing that are lavished upon us by God. We begin to get an inkling of you know, my, my maturity, uh, my level of maturity as a husband has grown by living with Connie. And, you know, how, how many of you know that before you get married, you have no idea what you're in for? <laughs> you think you do. Oh, it'll be great. We'll be married and we can do this and we can do that. And we can go here and, and it'll, be, it'll be just such a, such a great relationship. And you don't realize when you get in the marriage, whoa. She has bad breath in the morning and her hair is all messed up. I thought she'd wake up in the morning and her hair would just be so beautiful. And it's, you know, it's, uh, but, but you know what? There are, there are benefits to being married that I didn't understand until I got married and then matured in my relationship. And we, our relationship matured to the point that there are things that I, that I can expect of our relationship, not in a, um, not in a greedy way, but in a mature way, I now understand what a marriage relationship is all about and what those benefits are. And it's the same way with God, with our relationship with God before it's like, you know, if I have a relationship with Jesus, that's going to be great. What's going to be great about it? Well, I, I'm not sure, but it's going to be, I get to spend eternity with Jesus. But once you get to here, then you begin to know God and you begin to know the nature of God. You begin to understand from the Bible who he is and what he does. And we mature in our relationship with him. And then in verse 13, verse 13 in the Amplified Bible, Actually, verse 13, first of all, in the in, uh, New King James says, the things which we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but in words, you got to carry that word. In order to understand this scripture right here, verse 13, you've got to carry that word, the word words over. Listen to this. These things which we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but in my, my Bible says, which the Holy Spirit teaches, that which is talking about words. It should read like this. Look at your Bible and write some things in there if you need to. These things which we, these things, the, we're talking about the wisdom of God, we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but in words which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Can you see that? What I'm talking about? Have I confused you? Then let me read it to you out of the Amplified Bible. Just stop and listen to this. Verse 13, the Amplified Bible. Everybody just look and listen. For we are setting these truths forth in words, not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Holy Spirit, combining and interpreting spiritual truths with spiritual language to those who possess the Holy Spirit. Does that clear it up a little bit? What that means is that the spiritual truths by God uh, and interpreting spiritual truths, we do that with the spiritual language of the Holy Spirit. Amplified Bible. If you have an Amplified Bible, or if you have a, a Bible program where you can access it, read that, that scripture later because the hidden wisdom of God is, uh, is revealed to us when we, when we pray in the Holy Spirit, when we use our prayer language in conjunction with the Word of God. One of the things that's concerning to me as a pastor is I see people read their Bible and then I see people put their Bible down and pray in the Holy Spirit. And then when they're done praying in the Holy Spirit, then they pick their Bible up again and they read their Bible. And what we need to do as mature believers, what verse 13 is telling us to do is if we want to understand the hidden wisdom of God that's in the word, we need to read the word and pray in the Holy Spirit at the same time or interchangeably. Maybe not at the same time, but, but Holy Spirit, thank you that your will has been revealed to me in the word. And then pray in the Holy Spirit, pray in your own prayer language as you're reading the Bible. And it'll amaze you the things that the Holy Spirit reveals to you in the Word. It'll, it'll amaze you. It's a whole, because listen, this is a spiritual book. You don't read the Bible like you read the New York Times. You don't even, listen to this, you don't even read the Bible like you read a Christian book. 
No matter how deep the Christian book is, you read the Bible, this is a, a Christian book can give you a lot of great insight. And I mean, there, it's great to read and supplement that stuff, uh, supplement what you're uh, uh, learning with, with what people have, what's been revealed to them. But this is supernatural. This is what the Holy Spirit breathed on. This is supernatural. And when you pray in the Holy Spirit and you read this, things will come alive to you in the Bible that you've never seen before. Things that the, the hidden wisdom of God just comes right off the page and comes right up to you. I, you know, I, I had somebody maybe a month ago say, how do you, how do you get all that stuff? I, well, they, they wanted to know what commentaries I used. And, and I use, I'm not so spiritual, I can't use commentaries or learn some things. But they said, where do you get all this stuff that you teach us? Where do you get it? Who, who did you, who gives it to you? Um, and I said, well, the most important thing I do is lay my hands on the passage and pray in the Holy Spirit and ask the Holy Spirit to show me. Well, my, my sermon preparation begins, begins with a Bible, a blank legal pad and a pen sitting in a chair with a cup of tea during the fast, cup of coffee after Sunday and pray it in the Holy Spirit and saying, what do you want to say to the church? What do you want to say? The message that I'm going to deliver Sunday, once we're done, once you're done, what do you want people to leave here with? This past Sunday, what the Holy Spirit said, I want people to leave the church. How many times have I taught on tithing in 20 years? You know, how many times? He's never, I've never done that. He's never said, he said, I want people to understand that tithing is plowing the ground for their seed. Oh, so then I get a concordance and I start looking up things and I'm going, wow, this is everywhere. Look at this. Look at that. Wow, that's good. Look at that. Oh, hey, look at that. And I'm writing all this stuff down and I'm praying in the Holy Spirit and he's given me this message. And if you'll do that, you may not stand up here on a platform and preach a message that the Holy Spirit gives you. But if you'll lay your hands on the Bible and pray in the Holy Spirit and ask the Holy Spirit, he will reveal things to you. The hidden wisdom of God that's in this word. But I'm, I'm not, uh, I've got to be sure that... Uh, um, that I get to this one thing. Verse 13. No, we, that's what we just read. Oh, good. Here's what I'm going to get to. But the natural man does not receive the things of God, for they are foolishness to him. He cannot know them because they are spiritually discerned. We want to we wanna be open uh, but, but he who's, who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. We want to be open and we want to be a blessing to people. But, I, but I'll tell you, sometimes uh, you need to wait until people are ready to hear the word. I don't argue with anybody. I mean, I'm just up to here with arguing. You know, and I, I can, sometimes I can tell somebody, will, I can tell when they walk up the aisle. Well, here comes somebody, you know. And so when they're looking at a, pas a passage and it's the way they ask, I want you to explain this one thing to me. And it's just the way, and I can tell it doesn't matter if, you know, uh, the apostle Paul could walk up beside me and explain the scripture to them. And they still, not, they have decided uh, you're wrong. And I don't, I don't get into it. I just, you know, God bless you, brother. Well, I believe this passage means this. Good. Bless you. You know, let's don't, I'm not going to come to fisticuffs with you over that because, listen, the Bible is spiritually discerned and it says that the natural mind cannot understand the hidden wisdom of God. Can't understand it. So how many times have we had relatives, friends, coworkers, and every time we go into work, you know, we're trying to wrestle each other to the floor with it. Means this, no, it tongues passed away with the age of the apostles. No, they're still practiced today. No, they passed away. No, they're still here. No, they passed away. No, they're still here. You know what? I just assume not argue with you about it. Uh, because the natural man cannot, I can, you know, maybe, oh, and, and then we find another scripture and we think, oh, I'll take this scripture to work tomorrow and this will show them. Not if they have a natural mind, they're not going to get it until they have a spiritual mind and then the Holy Spirit can show it to them. Now, I want to close with this and this is going to really, really help you. Verse 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. I want to say, I have. I have. See, we're not trying to get the mind of Christ. Remember now, who are we talking to? See, 
Trying to tell these people you have the mind of Christ is, I mean, everybody, you see it in the Bible, so you know it's true, but it's really, it's hard to operate in the mind of Christ if you're, if you're still dealing with envy and strife and division, deception, and you have things you need to repent from. Trying to convince this person you have the mind of Christ when they haven't dealt with these things. You see how this progression works? Trying to convince this person you have the mind of Christ and they see it in the Bible and you can go around and say it. You can confess it over yourself. I have the mind of Christ. But if you haven't dealt with this, you're not ready to walk in this. Okay? So now, you know, once you've dealt with that, dealt with that, dealt with this stuff, overcoming the devil, understanding the anointing and these kinds of things, then you can get to the point of understanding the hidden wisdom of God. And then you can say with confidence, I actually really do have the mind of Christ. But what is the mind of Christ? In order to understand the mind of Christ, and I got four minutes to finish this in. In order to understand the, the, what this passage means when it says we now have the mind of Christ, the word Christ means, refers to the anointing of God. There are three words in the Bible that refer to uh, uh, Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ when he was on the earth. And it's those three words, Lord, Jesus, and Christ. Anytime in the New Testament that you read the word Jesus, it's referring to the humanity of Jesus. Anytime you see the word Lord, it's referring to the authority of Jesus. And anytime you see the word Christ, it's referring to the anointing of Jesus. So you'll see some passages and it will say the Lord Jesus Christ. It's referring to, and that passage, in order to interpret that passage about the life of Jesus accurately, it's talking about all three things. It's talking about his, his humanity, his lordship, and his anointing. But sometimes it will just say the Lord Jesus. That's referring to his authority and his humanity. Sometimes it just says the Lord, it's referring to his authority. Sometimes, like right here, it just says Christ. This does not say that we have, we now have the mind of Jesus. That's how we've interpreted this. We have the mind of Jesus. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say we have the mind of the Lord. Uh, you know, we've confessed, you know, I have, I have the mind of the Lord. Actually, no. It says we have the mind of Christ, which means we have what? Can anybody guess? The mind of the, we have an anointed mind. This passage is not necessarily saying that we have the mind of Jesus, the person. It's saying that we have the mind of the anointing. Why is this important? Because of the word mind. This says, but we have the mind of the anointing. The word mind, and, the, and you're going to need to write this down, and uh, uh, I really want you to get this. The word mind in the Greek language is the Greek word nous, N-O-U-S, nous. And I'm going to say this twice so you can get this because this is going to be amazing. It's going to really help you. When we're talking about you have the mind of Christ and you think his thoughts and we know the will of God. Many of you are sitting there going, but I, if I have the mind of Christ, I sure don't know what's going on. The word mind in the Greek language is the Greek word nous, N-O-U-S. And it means, I'll say it twice, the psychological facility of understanding, reasoning, and deciding. The Dictionary of Biblical Languages defines the word nous, N-O-U-S, as the psychological facility of understanding, reasoning, and deciding. Everybody got that? Or you want me to say it one more time? The psychological facility of understanding, reasoning, and deciding. Why is that important? When this says we have the mind of Christ, this is not talking about thoughts. This is talking about the ability to think through things. And this is where, this is, as opposed to knowing facts, when we're saying, well, you have the mind of Christ. We think that means, well, then we should know everything. But that's not what that word mind means. The word mind means it's the psychological facility of understanding, reasoning, and deciding. In other words, God, who knows everything, also has the, I mean, you know, if anybody could think through something, it would be God. See, and I never thought about this before until I explored this word because I always just thought God just automatically knew stuff. 
It's, it's hard for me to comprehend God sitting up there and thinking through something and deciding something. But they must have had reasoning because in the, uh, uh, or otherwise, Jesus in Genesis chapter one, Jesus would not have had to say to the, to the Father and the Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image. He's talking to somebody with an idea. It's not that, they all, that they're standing there telepathically, just already automatically knowing stuff. But in Genesis chapter one, Jesus says to the Father and the Holy Spirit, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Well, that means that God is communicating with himself about something that he is thinking about doing. I mean, you know, whatever God thinks about doing is right. He's going to do it. So this passage says we have the mind, the noose, the psychological fac facility of understanding, reasoning, and deciding. In other words, we're able to think through things. So that relieves the pressure of because we have the mind of Christ, thinking that we have to go around and automatically know everything. But what we do have, it's not, it's as opposed to knowing the facts, having the mind of Christ is not knowing as much as it is, it is the ability to process situations the way God would and come up with God's plan and God's way of doing things. This making sense? This is a little bit deep, but yeah, this is a little bit deep, but you all have already been through these classes, haven't you? So you're ready for, are you ready for this? Okay, well, that's what this is. This is what throws people off. They think that having the mind of Christ is knowing instead of processing, and they get frustrated because they think they should know instead of process. So now with the mind of Christ, whatever you're dealing with tomorrow, if you go into work and, uh, and you have a situation and you don't know the facts and you don't know exactly what to do, well, you do need to realize that as a mature believer, you have the mind of Christ and you have the ability to process and think through things to come up with the result that God wants you to come up with. And um, so that's why Romans chapter 12, verse two is so important. Romans 12, two says, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove what that good, uh, acceptable and perfect will of God. So when we become a believer, the very first thing we have to do is start transforming our mind. This guy right here, what this guy right here has to do is he has to start changing his mind about what? About everything, about everything. These people did me wrong and I'm going to get them back. No, well, we're going to try to grow you into a toddler so you realize you got to conquer envy, overcome strife, deal with division. You got to repent of your, uh, of your nasty nature and all that. And we're trying to grow people. And we do that by renewing our mind with the word of God so we can think God's thoughts, think his word after him. And so when we do that and we're processing things, what comes to our mind? It's not our flesh stuff or all that stuff. But as we're processing things, once we're a mature believer, a teleos, we're, we've matured to the point that it's the word of God that we think and we're able to process situations with the word of God and come up with God's plan, God's way of dealing with the situation. Are you good? Did you get that? I mean, is this something you can use, something you can work with? It's the, you know, we're talking about the hidden wisdom of God and Paul said God has already revealed this to us by, our, by his spirit. Amen? Amen? Amen, good, good. 